about uh, understanding the Old Testament by only looking at the New Testament. So I'm going to try to talk about some of the testing that's available. How do we recognize this disorder? Understand that there are two different types of these, uh, this disorder, and depending on what type of mast cell activation disorder you may have, will influence the type of treatments that are available to help you get uh, feel better. So if you go to the next slide, please. Actually, here we go. So if you ask this question, do you got allergies? Meaning chemical hypersensitivity, brain fog, cough, hives, itching, sinus problems, gut problems, uh, headache syndromes, food intolerances. A lot of people will say yes. Um, it has been noticed a rise in hypersensitivity disorders starting in the 1950s. Um, and this is kind of attributed to the fact that through efforts through uh, science and technology as well as public works, we've been able to really uh, coil some of the, the cells that have been stained with h &E. The red cells um, are antibodies that are targeted to a molecule on mast cells and they're perfectly round. Thank you. perfectly round. Um, when mast cells are, are spindle-shaped or, um, or uh, are clumped together, they, these guys really like to be isolated. They don't like to be too close to each other. Um, that suggests that you might have a mast cell disorder as well. In getting flushing episodes, um, do you find that your mood is changing? And I have to tell you, I have one patient um, who was diagnosed with postpartum depression uh, 30 years ago, and she was put on every psychiatric med you can think of. So the postpartum depression got put into uh, depression and anxiety and attention deficit disorder, and she's been on medications for 20 years plus. And I don't know if, if her adverse reactions to the medications or her undiagnosed immune disorder, um, but I have to tell you, once you identified her immune disorder, she was able to get off most of the medications. It's feeling much better. Um, then, uh, what a lot of allergy and immunology specialists use is to see whether or not you actually respond to medications that target the mast cells specifically. And I want to focus. So, what we use to diagnose mast cell activation disorder comes under the umbrella of the treatments that we use to treat mast cell activation disorders. Um, but here I'm mostly going to focus on what we use to try to diagnose the mast cell activation disorder and afterwards I'm happy to address some other uh, uh, allopathic as well as uh, complementary interventions that have been known to be very helpful, including mindful meditation, traditional Chinese herbal therapy, acupuncture, acupressure, um, exercise. Um, actually, in my office, I had the pleasure of a young lady who was diagnosed. Uh, she is a competitive uh, athlete, um, and unfortunately, this happens to a lot of women more than men, or young ladies compared to young gentlemen, um, was diagnosed with an eating disorder. Um, and they thought she was avoiding food because she wanted to maintain a competitive weight, as opposed to the fact that the food was making her sick and she was avoiding the food stuffs. Interestingly enough, uh, they put her into a residential facility and took away any privileges and she did not eat her 2,000 calories of food. And she ended up losing 10 pounds on top of her, you know, so she went from 125 down to 115. By the time I met her, she was at 102. So it's really important to kind of listen to the patient. Um, and I know it's very difficult for a lot of healthcare providers knowing that we have it, you know, maybe 15 minutes on a good day if you're in, in, in certain um, medical uh, facilities. Um, but after you get the story and find out how well you respond to medications, it's really important to get some laboratory data to kind of reinforce what you might be suspecting uh, uh, in these individuals that are coming with worrisome disorders that most of them have been suffering for, for years. Um, so the, and, and as, as I have shown before, uh, mast cells elucidate a lot of chemicals, and also a lot of the chemicals they elucidate are elucidated by other organs as well. But the markers that are specific for mast cells that are commercially available include serum and urine histamine, um, prostaglandin levels, uh, uh, tryptase, um, and then it's important to kind of biopsy the organ system that bothers you the most. And the issue here is, even with the biopsies, we don't know what the normal levels are 
um, just because not that many studies have been done to say, okay, what's the normal levels of mast cells that are found in the small intestine? Or what's the normal number of mast cells that are found in the tethered cord? Or what's the normal level of mast cells that are found in the bladder? And then after you've asked those three questions, it is really important, I have to tell you, mast cell disorders don't ride by themselves. And also, all that wheezes is an asthma, all that causes redness in your skin isn't necessarily a mass cell activation disorder. It's really important to rule out other disorders that may be contributing to your symptoms. So, talking about the first criteria, episodic signs and symptoms consistent with mass cell activation dysfunction. You need to ask yourself, you know, and it's amazing how we all kind of push through our symptoms, whether it's fatigue, I've had, I have had a patient push through repeated fainting spells, uh, feeling that's all she has known. Uh, I had another patient, and I kept on asking, her, it gets worse at night. So if you want to ask, exacerbate a sleeping disorder, have a pruritic disorder that interferes with your body's ability to rest. Um, of the chemicals you can see here, again, not only histamine is an issue, tumor necrosis factor. And I have to tell you, when it comes to mast cell activation disorders, we have individuals that either have problems with inability to uh, lose weight, and then we have individuals who have an inability to gain weight. And they're a rather suspicious of chemicals uh, like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin 6, which recruit in inflammatory cell and inflammatory processes that basically overtax your body's ability. You're basically stealing away from your normal housekeeping duties as well. This is a picture just showing all the different things that can happen with anaphylaxis. And I have to tell you, when it comes to immune mainly disorders, if you want to talk about a diagnosis that gets missed constantly in the emergency department, that's anaphylaxis. And that's because we only have one test, which is tryptase, which you can never get in the emergency department because they don't know what to do with it nor do they know how to order it. Um, and also, just the way we teach anaphylaxis. And, and, and the one point I want to make here is, anaphylaxis, and then you can't, you know, you can't breathe. Uh, I kind of treat anaphylaxis like the earthquake scale. You can have a grade one, where you're itchy all over, or you can have a grade five, where you need to call 911 10 minutes ago, where you actually have a cardiovascular respiratory compromise on everything in between. So if you're having sudden onset of fainting, and this is where it can overlap with other disorders, especially Dr. Sinke who just mentioned the issue about neurocardiac syncope as well, um, it's really kind of important to see whether or not you might be having a mast cell disorder contributing to your symptoms, whether it's throat closing or the sensation that you're feeling up, or if you're having neurocognitive impairment. I don't know if anybody has issues with when they ingest certain foods or certain climates that feel that their ability to think or remember or their mood changes. Uh, for women going in or out of their menses, they can also impact their ability to have uh, dysregulated mast cell populations as well. Epigastric distress is very common uh, in mast cell disorders, and that can present with bloating, uh, diarrhea, constipation, failure to thrive as well. Um, there have been a few uh, papers uh, looking at case series of patients that have been diagnosed with a clonal mast cell activation disorder. Uh, to the left uh, is individuals that were diagnosed with mast cell cytosis. It's a little bit skewed because these individuals have skin lesions that force them to go to a doctor that has expertise in mast cell cytosis. And so you can see that skin lesions are the presenting symptoms, but then after gastrointestinal distress, it's neuropsychiatric symptoms. Headache syndromes, mood disorders, sleep disorders, ability to think clearly or remember what you had thought about. And then more recently, this paper was done by a group in Boston where they looked at uh, 20 individuals that came to uh, an IBS clinic and asked them, and here's, here, here's a doctor who's thinking outside of the box, do you have any other symptoms besides your GI symptoms? And when you ask them, they're like, yeah, actually, I've had anaphylaxis, or I've, had, I've been treated for asthma. Um, but interestingly enough, number three is neuropsychiatric as well. And unfortunately, we don't have any quick tests to evaluate for, for, for neuropsychiatric changes. Um, 
uh, that are implemented in offices where you can measure whether or not somebody's having changes because they have mass health disorders. So there are plenty of triggers uh, that can cause mast cells to uh, release, either suddenly degranulate. Um, you have uh, classic IgE-mediated disorders or allergic disorders. Uh, the usual suspects in the food groups are uh, soy, gluten, nuts, seafood, milk, cows. And in the non-allergic triggers, uh, we have a lot of individuals that have occupational exposures, uh, whether they're chemical fumes, um, uh, medications will do it, uh, synthetic fibers, uh, some individuals um, have, and one way you can diagnose um, mast cell activation disorder in individuals uh, is whether or not they're having large local reactions to insect bites, especially mosquitoes. With IgE triggers, again, you've seen this substance before, you've made an antibody, it sits on the mast cells, and then when you see it again, there's that love shot I was talking about, you cause degranulation and release of these chemicals that cause you to become symptomatic. Again, these are the usual food triggers, but there's also common airborne triggers, including pollen, mold, animal dander, and components of dust. Uh, in the Bronx, the biggest offender is actually cockroach. Uh, and then there are plenty of non-allergic triggers, and I have to tell you, we have a lot of information on IgE-mediated disorders. We have very little information on the crosstalk between nerve fibers and mast cells that may lead to individuals that have cold-induced urticaria, angioedema, or anaphylaxis. Uh, we don't know exactly what's happening with some of these chemicals. I've had two patients anaphylaxed to Febreze being sprayed in the air. Uh, paint fumes, again, certain fibers that will cause local irritation. Uh, depending on where it sits as well. Several of the medications that patients receive. Um, I had a patient recently who's had pain syndrome for close to 10 years, and he's on several medications, uh, especially in the opioid family. And I gave him Zolier, uh, which is a molecule that goes after the Ig molecule, preventing mast cells from degranulating. And for the first three days in a long time, he was pain-free. He was so pain-free, he stopped his pain medications. So basically, he ended up with withdrawal symptoms, which then forced him to go back into that vicious cycle again. So I have to tell you, this is a team sport and a coordinated effort through lots of different disciplines. It's really important to understand that there's certain medications, like non-steroidals, even though aspirin and ibuprofen can cause mast cell degranulation, we can actually reintroduce it in most patients if they need it in a way that actually causes the mast cell disorder to get under better control. Um, there are immune-mediated factors that can cause mast cells to degranulate. Again, if you have an autoimmune disorder, including antibodies that go against your own mast cells or the antibody that sits on it, that can cause you to have a chronic mast cell disorder as well. This is kind of just to emphasize the different communication. Uh, I was trying to understand the what happens in the tissue. When it comes to cells, mast cells can either have direct contact, in this case this is a nerve fiber, or they can secrete chemical 